Hello and welcome to the Apostates Playground. I am Phineas 12 Gage, the High Apostate, and this is the podcast where I go through the Bible, social issues, anything surrounding religion or dives into the scriptures therein. This week is Genesis 29. There's been a lot of Bible episodes, and that's because I'm ramping up to a longer series on something deeply uh, traumatic and awful. So that'll be that'll be fun for everybody. So the first half of Genesis 29 is uh, pretty standard at this point, like kind of oppressively so. Uh, Jacob goes on a journey to find his cousin wife. He finds a bunch of sheep doing sheep people stuff. Ask if they know Laban. They do. So Jacob rolls the stone back and forth off the well, and that lets the sheep drink. Uh, single-handedly, if you ask Chabad, because Jacob lifts, I guess. Uh, he does all kinds of CrossFit and shit. Then Jacob finds out he's fine, and Rachel comes up. They introduce themselves. Jacob kisses her and screams. Uh, Rachel, apparently because she was crazy hot for this super CrossFit alpha Chad that screams when he receives affection, goes and tells her dad what happened, like she should when a random guy runs up and starts kissing on you. Uh, but then Laban comes and gives his new cousin son-in-law a hug and a kiss, and so Jacob stayed with them for a month, which is not what you should do as a dad if your daughter runs up and says, hey, this dude started macking on me. And so Jacob stayed with them for a month, because that's how you treat people in the Bible. And then things get, like, weird and servitude -y. The theme of uh, people being cheated out of birthrights and deals and such, and for some reason blame being wrongly assigned everywhere, is really a, a running thing here, and it doesn't stop now. It's going to keep that momentum going. Between Jacob meeting Rachel and Jacob, spoiler alert, marrying her older sister Leah, and then marrying Rachel, it was agreed upon that Jacob Shelt work seven years for his father's 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 son's 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 son, father of his soon-to-be wives and distant cousin, Laban. And his pay for this seven years of service would be Rachel, daughter of Jacob's father's 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 son's 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 son, mother of his soon-to-be children, and also distant cousin. It is getting pretty distant here, and would normally be where the incest arguments really fall apart. Because people like to act like the Bible is just full of interbreeding, and we're at relationships at this point that normally you could safely claim without looking it up are legal in most countries, at least in 50 states. And while that probably wouldn't be the gotcha that a lot of people on social media like to pretend it is, it kind of is, still is. Because the more you inbreed, the more deleterious it gets to the 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 health of the offspring. But the repeated racism here is a much better gotcha. It's the you better find a distant relative at the family reunion instead of marrying someone near you because they lower property values. And that's a fucking issue of a way to go through life. It does not lend yourself to big, you know, good guy energy. It does lend itself to big... I know there's a ceasefire, but we're going to keep bombing Palestinians energy, but it doesn't lend itself to big good guy energy. I would like to give special mention to how Jacob demands Rachel at the end of the seven years. He tells Laban to give him his wife because he's done so that he can go fuck her. Imagine walking up to your boss like, hey, I'm clocking out. I'm going to keep your daughter. Also, we're going to fuck. After that, it says, now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. I have two issues with this quote. The first is grammatical. You're not able to see it because it's an audio medium, but it gives the clause that he, Laban, transported Leah to Jacob, all brighted up, and then there is a semicolon. And the semicolon means that you were continuing the sentence by combining two independent clauses. It's a stylistic thing, but it carries some big implications. One of those implications is that the subject, the he who is doing an action, in this case Laban, didn't change at any point. Technically, from a standpoint of modern English, this means that Laban took Leah to Jacob and fucked her. Just like right on the table in front of Jacob. 
and I am stressing this from the modern English standpoint because that semicolon is in the original new uh, original King James version. That I can kind of forgive because of the history of the meaning of the semicolon and the rules of the English language. But the fact that it's in modern English is really telling to me that either this is completely okay behavior and we're kind of back to, boy, that kind of implies some weird incest things going on, or the people who updated the language of the book weren't really authorities because it wouldn't have destroyed and it actually probably would have improved the integrity of the verse to point out that the new he is not Laban who is going into Leah who he, Jacob, thinks is Rachel. In one of the uh, the episode is about this now, moves that I keep threatening, and I'm just going to start committing to, let me now welcome you to Flying Phineas's Festival of Frivolous Facts. Today is the semicolon. What it is, what it isn't, where it came from, and why two guys tried to kill each other about it in court. Cecilia Watson is a philosopher with a PhD in conceptual and historical studies of science from the University of Chicago. In her other life, however, she attempts to win my heart by writing whole bodies of work about semicolons. So I'm going to be leaning on that body of work because history of the semicolon is pretty niche, and I'm even struggling to find things that aren't reputable, much less things that are. The first instance of the semicolon was in 1494. It was used by an Italian printer named Alus Minutius in Cardinal Pietro Bembo's essay about climbing Mount Etna called De Etna. At the time, it wasn't what it is now, which is when you want to put two sentences together without a period or coordinating conjunction. It was just kind of a strong pause. Like a comma, but aggressively. Hey, you, you better slow down here. Shit is getting dramatic. It didn't catch another meaning until 1690. And if you're astute to biblical history, you know that that is 79 years after the King James Version of the Bible was completed— but the story doesn't end there. I promised some crazy semicolon history. I'm going to travel to 1830s France. Quoting from my sanantonio.com, quote, Using a semicolon when a colon would suffice can have deleterious consequences, as in the case of two French law professors clashing in 1837 on account of a passage of the Pandex. According to the Times of London, the dispute was over the Pointe Virgule. Uh, I will not apologize to French listeners. And that's French for semicolon. One legal scholar argued the passage needed a semicolon while the other contended a colon was unnecessary. Deadlocked, they decided duel would settle matters. The supporter of the semicolon lost out, suffering a minor flesh wound. At this point, the main rule of the semicolon was uh, as a way to start a particularly long list. It did do some work combining uh, conjunctions, but... Rules of English are relatively new. Uh, grammars didn't start until the 1500s, and that one I mentioned in 1690, which is by a guy named Ben Johnson, was one of the first ones. So it was kind of, everybody was playing around finding out what he could do with language. It was basically a punctuation time to be avant-garde. So the rules were semicolon interpretation after the meeting got a little more hammered down also caused two men to get different sentences for the same crime in 1927 New Jersey. A man by the name of Salvatore Rinelli was sentenced to life in prison while another man named Salvatore Mera got the death penalty. So big consequences for a little comma with a dot on it that no one knows how to use. It also apparently caused Boston to outlaw booze for six years and almost fucked trying Nazis for war crimes. So Thanks, the semicolon. Both of those are things I desperately want to know more about, and looking for hours and hours over the course of days, I could not find anything that did not refer back to Professor Professor Watson and her book. It's a book that's on the list. Unfortunately, there's a lot of books on the list, so I don't know when I, I'm going to be able to get to it, but when I do... This may become a grammar podcast for a little bit. And to steer back to this being relevant in any meaningful way, the the semicolon in the Bible verse was originally used as a hard but not full stop. As I mentioned earlier, it wasn't until later that it took on the meanings of indicating a list starting or putting conjunctions together. 
1982, the new King James Version came out with updated language, the world for semicolon use had changed, but not that much. Today, the semicolon is a way to connect two independent clauses without a coordinating conjunction, so without putting a comma and for, comma and, comma nor, comma but, etc. Actually, in case it comes up on any English tests, an independent clause is essentially a complete sentence. It's got a subject, someone doing that subject, the sentence things, and you can put them together by putting a semicolon, as I say, or one of the conjunctions plus a couple others to establish a relationship between them, and in the cases of shorter sentences, make the sentence a little less impactful. It's really a style and tone choice. The coordinating conjunction words that go with commas if you're not using a period or semicolon are for and nor but or yet and so, and that acronyms to fanboys. So according to really any kind of rules of English that you use, the implication here is bad. And it was presumably educated people who translated the King James Version. The it was presumably educated people who had gone to a college who did the uh, New King James Version. So somebody along the way somewhere should have gone, hey, guys, maybe we switch this he to Jacob. Because that'd be better grammatically. It'd be more clear. And beyond that, I, I'm really at this point just waving in the distance to uh, where I crossed the line into being needlessly pedantic. So back to the verse that reads, Now it came to pass in the evening that he, sentence subject Laban, took Leah, his, sentence subject Laban, daughter, and brought her, sentence subject Laban's daughter Leah, to Jacob, and he, presumably Jacob, but grammatically sentence subject Laban, went into her. Bible for did fuck stuff. And that's been a long trip, but it's a long trip to get to the point that what that sentence means now and what it meant in 1611 is that Jacob did his seven years of service and so Laban had sex with Leah in front of him. It's not a debate gotcha. It's not a good thing to bring up an argument. It's barely a advisable thing to fill 10 minutes of a podcast with, but I, I'm not going to have that in my head and not tell you. And I went the long way to get there, so I brought you along for the journey, dear listener. My second issue with this verse is the fact that apparently Laban's daughters are completely interchangeable, and it's expected that you won't notice and everything will carry on and just be fine. Admittedly, that's a much bigger problem. It is written in some other texts that Leah and Rachel were twins, but if they're twins, they were presumably born at the same time, and also, if they were identical twins, then they looked similar enough, and like, none of this makes sense if they're twins. So, keeping in mind without the explanation and in the explanation, there's more bullshit ahead, and it's already some, some goddamn bullshit. So Jacob was pretty pissed that Laban showed up to declare him married to not the daughter that he took as agreement to have as his wages. And Jacob agreed to work another seven years because it's taming of the shrew rules. Dog, younger daughter can't get married until your older one does. Her value is decreasing. She's an older model, etc., and that's actually where it starts to fall apart if they're if they're twins um, immediately. She's not that much older. It's not that important. So it's it's hard to say that, you know, it's hard to say that it's it's so uncouth when there's going to be minutes of difference, maybe hours, maybe. I don't know how long twins gestate and I've gone completely off script at this point. It also says that he didn't recognize until the next morning, which which really makes me want to know what happened the next morning. Was there a was there a tell? 
did she have a mole? Was he aware of a mole Leia had that Rachel didn't, or like a burn or something? Did she just roll over and go, oh, hi, I'm Leia, Laban didn't clue me in about the tricking you into thinking that you're marrying Rachel plan? It doesn't make any sense. It falls apart right away. So Jacob agrees to uh, work another seven years uh, to get Rachel. And after he does, we're told that Rachel is the favorite wife and we move on to their kids and some information about the wombs of the wife women. So because Leia was not the favorite, she was unloved. God made her fertile, but he didn't make Rachel fertile, which is pretty wild to me. It actually makes sense in this case that there would be a a level of resentment present in the relationship with Leia with Jacob towards Leia. I mean, the the whole thing is fucked. I'm not defending him, but if we pretend for a second that this is in any way an acceptable way to get a wife, if I wanted to marry someone, if I was head over heels in love with them, The way that she existed near sheep was just captivating, so much so that I was willing to be a servant for years to marry her. And at the end of that seven years, I had to work to marry her. I was presented with the other sister and had to work another seven years. I would be the fuck pissed at the dad, at Leia, at everybody, at the sheep. Fuck the sheep everybody would be a bad guy to this right now. And there wouldn't really be a reason for it. I mean, Laban, sure, Leia in this social structure is is currency. So Rachel is also currency. Basically, what happened is the, the Bronze Age equivalent of agreeing to work for one $5 bill, getting the other $5 bill, and then having to work more for the one $5 bill. I'd be pretty upset at that $5 bill if I had such an emotional connection to the other one, the one that I agreed to work for. So while everybody in the story other than Rachel and Leia are villains, but it's pretty easy to sympathize, I think, with why Jacob isn't super invested in his marriage with Leia. So what happens? What's what's the response to that? How is that handled He takes the story that, quite frankly, in this episode has already had a lot of things granted to it for no other reason than charitability and argument. And he makes it worse by handling it, by enabling her to fulfill her role as a baby dispenser because God is a feminist icon. There is another way to read this, one that's grounded a little more in reality, and it's pretty gross. Now, to preface this, because it makes it less gross, it turns it from a gross take on something that may have been inspired by something someone actually did and turns it into just a gross story. And those are everywhere, so it should be a little easier to swallow. The odds that this book is talking about actual people is basically zero. There's a video in the show notes by a guy named Matt Baker that goes over the Yahwist, Eloist, Priestly, and Deuteronomist traditions. The short version is, because that's there mainly because I haven't gotten to that episode yet either, because I'm better at making plans and following through with them. The Bible was written by multiple people, probably from different tribes entirely, working from different information, constructing multiple mythologies that all got smunched into one when the Bible was compiled. Now, the other option is that they realized at some point that girls have to hit puberty in order to have children. And Leia was clearly going to do it first because she was older, and that's obviously how it works. I'm not, I'm not uh, really counting on the writers of the Bible for a lot of intellectual legwork in this example. And I realize that she has to be at least 18 by this point, but it stands to reason that what they would know about what age affecting being able to have children and all that generally what we end up with is rachel and leia being teenagers going through puberty with leia going through puberty first because she was older unless she was a twin in which case this makes no sense but neither does any of this there are some sources that give their ages 22 which 
is a little old to be going through purity, but again, I'm not counting on the people who wrote the Bible for a lot of medical accuracy. So I kind of count that as just a like a bucket of farts. Then we get a quick run through of being told that she had Reuben of sandwich fame, after whom she hoped her husband would love her. But apparently he didn't, because then she had Simeon of Simeon Says fame, and Levi of Jean's fame. And after each, she just hoped that Jacob would find something to love about her. This is a really sad movie, actually. And the only question left is, what are we supposed to take out of this? Again, this is I'm approaching this like this book is what I was told it was when I was a child, that there was something on every page that was relevant to life and would help you grow and come closer to God. And what is that in this section of the book? Apparently, it's the fact that evangelizing is hard. In a footnote for Genesis 29.20, the part that says, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for he, for the love he had to her, we're directed towards 1 John 5.3, which reads, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. In context, that verse is about overcoming the world by keeping the faith in Jesus to get strength, and that kind of makes sense. But what that has to do with Jacob being in servitude to get Rachel his wages, or more so what it has to do with Laban paying him Leah instead, I have no idea. I spent two days trying to connect these dots, and if you put the verses in context, and not even a lot of context, it turns into something like, Jacob worked seven years to get Rachel and he was given Leah, so he kept working, but it's important to overcome obstacles, is F.B. Meyer thought, blessing accrues through hot heartbreak. And this is equivalent to evangelizing because you catch a lot of shit for annoying people with your religion, but you have to overcome worldly obstacles like people finding you annoying when you're screaming at them on the street in order to earn the rights to marry your cousin. I put it back into context at the end. I was supposed to take it out of that. And that's the chapter. That's the whole thing. And we're told evangelizing is hard. In a story about Jacob working 14 years to get a person, because after the first seven years, he was tricked and given the wrong person. He doesn't want the first person, and she's sad, so God lets her be a baby-making factory, because it's the only way she can get affection, because vandalism is hard. The only moral I can pull out of this episode is if you're careless with your semicolons, you might fuck your daughter in front of her husband and make lawyers try and kill each other. I, I don't know what kind of moral that is. The last part of it seems kind of fine. Now, I've been Phineas 12 gs This has been the Apostates Playground. The website is theapostatesplayground.com. It is new. It is up. I had help. It is glorious. The email is powered by apostasy at gmail.com. The Twitters are the letter X, essential panda, and apostasy at apostasy powered. I will talk to you, at you soon. And remember, don't fuck your kids in front of their spouses. Or at all. Don't fuck your kids. Learn how semicolons work. <laughs>